ओम ज्ञान ज्ञानाजनशलाकाया चक्षुरोन्मल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओं विष्णुपदा कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतीता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे 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 कृष्णा थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर गिविंग द अपॉर्चुनिटी टुडे टू स्पीक ऑन द भागवतम विद ऑल ऑफ यू एंड वी आर इन द टेंथ कैंटो दैट वाज टेक्स्ट 23 एंड 24 द 23rd टेक्स्ट वाज डिस्क्राइबिंग हाउ इति घोरतमा भावात सन्निवृत्तः स्वयं प्रभु आस्ते प्रतीक्षमस तज्जन्म हरेर वैरानुबंधकृत सो इति घोरतमाद भावाद इन दिस वे विथ अ वेरी घास्टली मेंटेलिटी घोरतमाद इन इंग्लिश वी हैव गुड बेटर एंड बेस्ट दीज आर सुपरलेटिव्स सो घोर घोरतर एंड घोरतम सो इट्स बैड वर्स एंड वर्स्ट इन दिस वे ही हैड द मोस्ट रिप्रेहेंसिबल मेंटेलिटी सनी वृत्तः स्वयं प्रभु इन दिस वे हिज कॉन्शियसनेस वाज कवर्ड his his understanding was completely distorted aste pratiksham stat janma in this way tat janma the birth of that person who was prophesied to be the cause of his death pratikshamas he started expecting he started waiting hare vaira anubandhakrit hari that supreme lord hari vaira anubandha so vaira means enemy anubandha means in that that was the way he was connected with him krut he was bound his actions were binding him to the lord in a relationship of enmity oh this is my enemy who is going to come to kill me how will i deal with him and then the next verse where there is a purport is asina samvisham stishthan bhunjana paryatan mahim chintayano rishikesham apashyat tanmayam jagat so asina when he was sitting some visham when he was lying down or relaxing tishthan when he was doing anything else for that matter some visham some visham tishthan when he was situated bunjana when he was taking food paryatan when he was walking about mahim mahim means he was just strolling or going for a walk chintayano rishikesham he was contemplating on the lord apashyat tanmayam jagat in this way he saw the whole universe filled with the lord tanmayam tanmayam means by him maya is filled so this is he, was, he saw the whole universe filled with lord, the lord lord rishikesh or lord krishna so what is going on over here this is describing the consciousness of the demon kamsa who has heard that oh i am going to be killed by vishnu and i am going to be killed by vishnu so what should i do about it so he thinks that i have to be ready for it but how can i be ready well the way to be ready is to see when is when is it going to come where is it going to come so he is constantly thinking about him so this is a remarkable level of subtlety or sophistication within one's consciousness or within the analysis of consciousness as described in the bhagavatam shila prabhupad started this movement and he called it the international society for krishna consciousness so krishna consciousness our purpose is to be conscious of krishna and yes that is very important at the same time you no know, there is something So in one sense when you talk about consciousness that is itself internal 
it is not just about krishna activities okay so when uh, it is okay are you doing this are you doing this are you doing that it is not about externals it is about internals but then there is a further level of sophistication here even when we are analyzing internals there could be different levels of internals that we could analyze so what does that mean that not only what we are think what we are doing is important what we are thinking is even more important but you could say that why we are thinking what we are thinking is even more important so there is a third level of sof uh, sophistication which we are discussing over here hmm? why so that broad theme which i'll be discussing today is why motivation matters in spirituality so generally you talk about spirituality is a matter of consciousness and yes definitely it's a matter of consciousness but somebody may even be conscious of krishna but why is that person conscious of krishna that is very important so here kamsa is thinking about krishna but what is his reason for thinking about krishna it is not out of affection it is not out of devotion it is not out of a desire to devote himself to krishna at all none of those desires are there for him he is thinking about krishna simply because um, he wants to uh, he thinks of krishna as an enemy and he thinks i have to kill krishna so that is not at all considered a very uh, auspicious thing so thinking about krishna is auspicious but um, uh how much deeper are we going into spirituality how, what are we thinking about and why are we thinking about so we could say that i am using a powerpoint as a whiteboard and i type some things as we discuss so if you want to go deeper into spirituality we say what are we doing that's one thing that's our action then what are we thinking about that's a deeper level and then why are we thinking about the things we are thinking about so this is even deeper so we could say this is at the level of actions this is at the level of thoughts and this is at the level of motivations so generally when we talk about consciousness we usually think about it in terms of thoughts okay what are you thinking about but consciousness includes both what we are thinking about and why we are thinking about so somebody may come to krishna say for example if a if say a temple is having a, it's a opulent temple so maybe there is a there are a lot of wealthy things in the temple lot of uh, expensive things in the temple a thief may come to a temple and they may remember everything okay you know that is the place where the jewelry is kept that is the place where the accounts is there this is this painting is looks very expensive this is this is mediocre actually that that thief may come to a temple and the thief may more carefully observe everything in the temple than what a devotee may also observe so in one sense they may even observe on the altar okay what is what is worth stealing if somebody is thinking like that but is that krishna consciousness well well yes and no why in essence no because if we consider if we want to consider krishna consciousness it's about both things it's about our contemplations and our motivations for those contemplations so contemplation is what we are thinking steadily it's not just what we think about occasionally but another is motivation for the contemplation so here we see that kamsa has the contemplation he is thinking about krishna but vairanubandhakrut he is thinking of krishna as a enemy and that is not considered conducive for a devotional relationship now that raises a question is it bad is it good well in one sense thinking about krishna is good say now we may say that oh person this person is a robber they'll go and rob anywhere so if they come to a temple they're remembering krishna isn't that good well yes in the ultimate sense it is good 
but if after that they are going to attack they are going to rob from a temple that is not good so good and bad maybe they rob from some other place actually no robbing is good but robbing from god directly is is quite quite reprehensible so we could say that what is what is good and what is bad we have to look from different perspectives so from the immediate perspective kamsa is, is acting as the enemy of krishna and in that sense that is not at all good that is bad so uh, what happens is ideally speaking what we want is if there is a, see when we talk about motivation there are multiple words but motivation is often related with emotion when i have motivation for something then i have emotion associated with it otherwise there is not much emotion in it so contemplation can be very we could say dry or dry or unemotional it can be we don't want dry unemotional kind of contemplation we want contemplation which is permeated with emotion so if suppose somebody is Hmm. Suppose somebody wants to be Krishna conscious, or somebody wants to be spiritually conscious. So, what we would like ideally is that there is a blend of the the spiritual, the motivation, and the hmm, the motivation and the uh, contemplation. Both are there. So, we could say broadly. are you able to see my screen right now okay sorry i don't know what happened suddenly it stopped uh let me see if i can fix this so there is the motivation for being krishna conscious and there is the intention of being krishna conscious or rather there is the the, the con con contemplation so if i we ask what is krishna consciousness okay. this is there is a lot in it prabhupad says that it is to think about krishna with a desire to be with him so it is motivation plus contemplation both have to come in if it's only one that's not the most animated way of being krishna conscious so how do we get both of these together so if you consider a pendulum so if there is there is motivation now is it possible that there is motivation the motivation is there that means there is emotion generally as i said whenever there is motivation there is emotion over there if i am highly motivated then there is a lot of emotion in something it may be anything if you are somebody is watching a sports match they are watching baseball then if they want a particular team to win then their emotion involved is much more in that oh okay this this score was made that score was not made there a lot of emotion involved in it on the other hand when you talk about contemplation that is associated more with we could say cognition it is information i contemplate on it i contemplate on the mountain i contemplate on a river i contemplate on god so what we want is a balance of motivation and a motivation and contemplation so we want the emotional aspect and we want the intellectual aspect so what are the emotions driving me why am i doing what am i doing and then do i know what is the importance of what i am doing so does so we want to think about krishna but it's what is our motivation for thinking about krishna if it comes as thinking krishna is my enemy and i want to destroy him then he really doesn't know krishna he doesn't know who krishna really is so cognition here means one should know krishna properly with one's intelligence and that is where the philosophy comes in the philosophy helps us understand that krishna is our greatest well wisher once we understand that krishna is our well wisher so then what happens is then naturally the emotions become positive hmm. so we can say krishna is our benefactor once we understand the surudam sarvabhutanam then that will that is that that is what when we study the philosophy 
that should be the result and on the other hand with respect to emotion it is you understand that krishna is the source of all pleasure he is ram ramati ramayati one who delights and one who gives delight so we could say broadly when these two things we understand that okay by contemplation i may understand krishna is the source of krishna is benefactor he wants good for me but still there are many things which we know are good for us but we may not really be attracted to them say eating broccoli is good for us but well that's not the most attractive food to eat so with respect to krishna on one side we want to be intellectually convinced that he is the ultimate reality connecting with him is the best for us but on other side it's not just that he is the ultimate reality he is also the ultimately attractive reality he is not just a benefactor he is also attractive connecting with him is not just good for us it will also make us feel good in the long run maybe not immediately but in the long run so when we understand this hmm, what happens is we understand that connecting with him is not just good for us hmm, it will also make us feel good feel good not in the temporary sense no? in the long run eternally it will make us feel good because we'll become purified we'll become restored to our pure spirituality our pure state of eternal spiritual virtue so in that sense for kamsa what is happening is his motivation is off because his cognition is also off he's thinking about krishna but he's not thinking with knowledge with understanding and that is where the problem is coming up and that is something which has to be addressed hmm. so what happens we will see in the future how kamsa will send many demons and will try to kill krishna and eventually kamsa will have to meet with his fate he will have to meet the consequences of his misdeeds but the key point is that he he exemplifies this thinking about god but not thinking about god in a favorable way so that is also good but that is not the best way to do it that is not the way the the devotee wants to think about the lord so i'll make one more point and then well summarize and we can have some questions that the bhagavatam has one very distinct to description that the ultimate purpose of life is liberation why liberation because we are limited by the many circumstances that we face in life we are at the very basic level we are limited by our life span so now life's ultimate purpose from the bhagavatam's perspective is liberation now if you see in the west the word liberation is not as common as the word liberty now there's the statue of liberty in america one of the most celebrated icons and generally the word liberty we associate with freedom now of course what it means is nobody else should control us we should have our free will the current war between russia and uh, ukraine is is positioned as a war for the protection of democracy and then that triggers people's emotions yes we should support so liberty is something which liberty freedom independence democracy these are words which captivate our contemporary mind now in the spiritual traditions of india the understanding is yes that there could be a state of bondage and there could there could be a state of uh, subordination there could be a state of freedom but eventually everyone is bound even the head of state even a absolute autocrat a tyrant is bound how see everyone is bound by time time means what everyone has to grow old everyone has to get diseased everyone has to die mm. so that takes us to 
aging and death but that's not the only thing see we are also bound by conditions and that is why one of the words used for souls in this world is conditioned soul so conditioned soul means what the soul's happiness even the soul's very existence depends on so many conditions if the temperature drops too much we won't be able to survive we as souls are not going to be destroyed but our bodies won't survive or for that matter if you are put in a situation where we don't have enough food enough water we won't be able to survive so there are so many conditions that we need for our survival and we could say these are basic conditions for our survival so so for our survival and for our pleasure also so depending on who we are in what situation we are in say if we consider an extreme example of somebody who is addicted then for that person without the substance that they are addicted to they just can't survive just they feel i will die without it they will not physically die but they feel like that they are very very dependent on those conditions now we may not be addicted to to substances but we all have what we can say are attachments and when something we are attached to is made unavailable to us is taken away from us then we suffer we going to go great distress so if somebody says that no i am not in distress i am happy well good you can be relatively happier than others that's nice we don't know nobody wants anyone to be miserable but basically if you under, want to understand distress in a broad sense we can say to not get what we want and to get what we don't want yasmat priya priya vyog sanyog janma prahlad says that to not get not get means to be separated from that is called as vi yog the word yoga is often associated with uh, physical postures that just wa- what we that's just one meaning of the word yoga but yoga means connection so and vi yoga means disconnection so to not get what we want so that which is priya that which is desirable for us we don't get it we get separated from it and to get that means yoga yasmat priya priya yoga sanyoga janma to get what we to to get what we don't want what is apriya that means say if we are if we are traveling from place a to place b we, we are going by a flight and we want the window seat and no window seat is available Well, that's an annoyance it may not be a catastrophe but it is an annoyance so we don't get what we want maybe we want we are tra- going to office and we are going for work and we don't want a traffic situation but there's a traffic uh, the traffic is very high and we get we get delayed that's something which we don't want we get it now sometimes uh, maybe we are in a party or somewhere we are get together and everybody sitting for dinner and there's one person we don't like in the party and our sitting arrangement is we sit right next to that person so what happens is so so many times we get what we don't want or maybe we want to meet some person and that's the reason why we have gone to that party and that person doesn't turn up over there so we don't get what we want so there are so many ways in which in life we are put in situations where we don't get what we want so why am i discussing all this the point is distress in the world is unavoidable so we are bound by time we are bound by conditions so what happens is the ultimate purpose of life is considered to be liberation not just liberty in this world liberty in this world is important we don't want anybody politically dominating over us but more important than that is to have spiritual freedom to not be bound to external conditions we are spiritual beings so space and time so space and time should not constrain us that is the ultimate purpose of life and what the bhagavatam says is if we remember krishna steadily if we become attached to krishna then we all will move toward liberation so the key to liberation what is it it is 
if we consider from one perspective it is to become attached to the unlimited so key to liberation from the limited our life span is limited our situations limit us our bodily abilities limit us so the key to liberation is attachment to the unlimited the more we become attached to the lord the more we become freed from the domain of the limited so if my happiness is not coming from my physical situation it is coming from my internal connection then whatever happens i won't be so disturbed so what do we do if we can connect with the lord then that inner connection inner connection it frees us from dependence on outer situations and that is considered to be one of the characteristics of liberation we become free it's too hot it's too cold we are pleasant people we are unpleasant people we are being respected we are not being respected okay yeah those things we are aware of them but they don't dominate our consciousness because we have found inner fulfillment we have found inner satisfaction inner connection with krishna so now what the bhagavatam says is the normal way to become liberated is to actually become devoted to krishna so when we become devoted to him when he becomes more dear to us than anything else in the world then he takes us out of the world so that's when can one become liberated from the world now the key is by key i mean the pathway and then i found is a qualification the qualification for liberation liberation from the world is what that when our desire for god becomes greater than our desire for anything in this world then god has no reason to keep us any longer in this world it is as long as we desire the things oh i want a better home i want a better partner i want a better position i want a greater respect when we have the thing i i want a better car i want a better phone whatever it is as long as we have desire for things in this world those desires keep us here but now if, even if we don't get rid of all those desires at least our desire for krishna becomes greater than all those desires then we attain krishna and krishna has no reason to keep us in this world we come out of the world and we attain him so this is the normal way to attain liberation but and this is not only normal this is the recommended way but krishna is so merciful that even for somebody like kamsa who thinks about him negatively krishna will liberate even such a person that is mercy is he is he just sees oh you are thinking about me and i'm happy that you are thinking about me you could be thinking about so many things you are thinking about me now it's so in one sense amazing that actually kamsa will be thinking about krishna for the purpose of destroying krishna but what is krishna doing krishna will reciprocate by destroying kamsa's material existence by ending kamsa's material bondage so that is krishna's extraordinary mercy so that's why it is so this is let's put it this way krishna's this is extraordinary mercy now just because it extraordinary that doesn't mean it is desirable it's not that we seek to this way we seek to act in this way that though krishna so the kamsa thinks about krishna for destroying him oh, where will krishna be where can i find him how can i destroy him krishna reciprocates by destroying his material existence that means by liberating him so why is so krishna merciful over here because krishna focuses on his contemplation more than his intention than his motivation 
That is the meaning of Krishna being. Krishna is called as Bhavagrahi. He is the essence seeker. He is the essence seeker. So, he sees, in Sanskrit it is called as Bhavagrahi. He sees the motivation, he, he sees the heart, he sees the consciousness. And there is something good in the consciousness. You say the bhav is bad over here. Okay, the motivation is bad, but there is something good. So Krishna sees the small thing that is good and he appreciates that. So the Bhagavatam's focus is that if Krishna can elevate and liberate even somebody who thinks about it in a hostile mood, then if somebody thinks about him in a devotional mood, somebody thinks about him in a mood of love and service, then why would Krishna not liberate such a person? Krishna will surely liberate him. So the, the exceptional, exceptional examples in the Bhagavatam, so this is, as I said, exceptional example. Kamsa getting liberated, um, the exceptional or you can say extreme examples. Sometimes the word extreme has a negative connotation, like extremism. But it's extreme in the sense that, that this is not the normal way to it. So, so the Bhagavatams, the extreme examples are not meant to normalize the extreme. This is not the recommended way the Bhagavatam says. So we know the Bhagavatam is being spoken to a king who is about to die, Parikshit. Now he is not told, oh, you start, you start thinking of Krishna as your enemy. No, it is not meant to normalize the extreme. It is rather meant to increase our faith in the normal process. In, so normal process means what? Oh, we just chant Hare Krishna every day. Hear the, uh, we hear the Bhagavatam class. We read about Krishna. We think, what is all this going to do? It seems so ordinary. Am I doing anything special? No, it, it may not seem like special, but it is very special. So it is not meant to normalize the standard, not normalize the extreme, but rather it is, it is, or you could say not normalize, it is, let's use the word, standardize the extreme. The standard process that is there, which we are all trying to follow, the standard process, it is meant to increase our faith in that, increase our inspiration to follow this process. So if Krishna can elevate and liberate somebody who is thinking about him as an enemy, and if somebody thinks of him as a lord, then um, that why doesn't it, why will not he liberate somebody who thinks about him in the mood of a devotee? He will definitely do that. And that is Krishna's supreme mercifulness. So I'll summarize what we discussed today and then we can have a few questions. I talked about four main points. First point, I started by talking about how Kamsa is thinking about Krishna, but we have when we want to go deeper into spiritual life, it's first we look at what a person is doing, then we look at a person what a person is thinking, but then deepest means we go, why are they thinking what they are thinking? So there is action, then there is contemplation, and then there is motivation. So the Bhagavatam is going at a very deeper level. So Krishna consciousness means it's an integration of both motivation and contemplation. Motivation helps us to uh, activate our emotional faculty. When we are highly motivated, then our emotions are engaged over there. And the contemplation is associated with our cognitive faculty, where we connect with Krishna understanding who he is. So when the cognitive when the cognitive contemplative faculty is positively engaged, then we understand that Krishna is our greatest well wisher that connecting with Krishna is good for me. And when the motivation is positively engaged, then we understand Krishna, connecting with Krishna is not just good, but it feels good. It feels great. And that combination is the most potent way to move ahead in our bhakti. And then we talk about liberty, liberation, that Krishna consciousness is the ultimate way to become liberated. We are all limited. We may not be politically restricted, but we are restricted by time. We are restricted by conditions. And more important than political liberty is spiritual liberation. So uh, the no standard way to get spiritual liberation is to become attached to the unlimited more than anything limited in the world. But the exceptional example of Kamsa over here is 
that although he has no attachment to Krishna, but Krishna is so compassionate that just he's thinking about me. Seeing that, Krishna liberates him. And this is not meant to standardize that way of contemplating on Krishna, but to inspire us toward the standard process of connecting with Krishna in a mood of bhakti. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So I'm looking at the comments. Yes. Um, yeah, that conditioned soul explanation is quite illuminating. Even when I had heard it for the first time about 10 years ago, 15, 16 years ago, I was quite illuminated. Now, connecting with the unlimited helps us uh, grow. That is, there's a verse in the seventh canto. Uh, dvesha, uh, what is, how do you start? Yeah, bhayad kamso dvesha chaidya daya, gopya kamad bhayad kamso dvesha chaidya daya rupa, rupa. So, that is the verse which I had in mind over here. Gopya kamad bhayad kamso. That is 7131. That is the verse. Which so any way one is one connects with the unlimited, that will liberate one. Was that what you are looking at? Looking for? Hmm. Yes. Are there any other points for reflection discussion? Yes, Roy. Hare Krishna. Can you hear me? Hear me? Okay. Yes. It's wonderful how you're speaking about the spectrum. Um, some ways of thinking of Krishna are better than others and how that makes us feel good and how it's liberating and we become detached from very good point detached from the external conditions an interesting concept is that what makes it better is that if we're doing something to please krishna if we're showing love then krishna is more pleased by that because he knows that's good for us you know last night we had an interesting Krishna, you, you, you're glorifying how merciful Krishna is to offer this access even to people who may not have the best motivation. Last night we had a conversation with a gentleman, I'll say gentleman, uh, and he was quite inimical. He even was saying, there is no Krishna, right out. <laughs> and I was thinking how wonderful is Krishna that even though he's saying there is no Krishna, he's saying Krishna. So yeah. then I said to him, what, what did you say? He said, there is no Krishna. I said, who? Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. <laughs> so <laughs> Krishna is so clever that even in the most uh, uh, indirect way, people are benefiting, like Kamsa is benefiting by thinking of Krishna so completely. How wonderful is Krishna? Yes, bro. Somehow, many times people who deny the existence of God they also are in their own way conscious of God. So in some ways, you know, an atheist is thinking about God and if they get rational explanations, they may also become theistic. So there is, there is something like, uh, what I can say is philosophical atheism and there's something like psychological or emotional atheism. So if, there were, if somebody is a philosophical atheist, that means they, they have not found rational arguments for the existence of God, and maybe they have heard from atheists, and then they have become convinced. Philosophical atheists are actually relatively easier to persuade. But somebody who is a psychological atheist, that means that that person has had bitter experiences with religious people, or that has person seen that person has seen maybe the they seen stark examples of human suffering and depravity, and it's not so much a logical conclusion as more the emotional. How can God exist? Then for such people, arguments, even not argument in the sense of being argumentative, but intellectual persuasion doesn't help so much. Maybe they just need to have many more positive interactions with devotees and gradually they may become more open. But till that time, as you suggested, just getting them to chant Krishna's names, that also is, is subconsciously working to increase their spiritual credits and help them Come closer to Krishna eventually. Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Hey, Krishna Rahul. Um, Hare thank Krishna. you so, thank you so much for class. I um, yeah. was just reflecting how much I loved um, your point about Kamsa being envious of Krishna because he doesn't really know Krishna, 
And, and it was making me think of is, that is the same true if we're envious of people. We don't really see the Krishna in them. We're looking at it with selfish motivation. So that was such a great, wonderful point because enviousness is so insidious and so horrible that to really see it in that way, I found very helpful. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. That's a very good point. See, what happens is, Generally, whenever we have some negative emotion towards some, it could be envy, it could be anger, it could even be uh, lust or whatever. Whatever happens in those situations is that we are reducing that person to one particular attribute of this. So maybe I'm envious of this person because I may feel that I work so hard, but nobody appreciates me. And this person doesn't do anything and everybody praises them. So now, even if that is true, even if that is happening like that, what are we doing is we are reducing the person to the praise that they are receiving. But if we connect with the humanity of the person, if we can connect with the spirituality, that is wonderful. Spirituality means, as you said, we see the, them as souls, as parts of Krishna, that's wonderful. But even if we just connect with the humanity of the person, is, you know, try to understand them as a person, he says, okay, they are getting this praise and maybe they don't deserve it. That's, that's, that's one part of it. But that doesn't define their life, who they are. So generally, when we get to know people, then quite often the reductionistic labels that we apply to them, that, that we realize, hey, this is, this is not really applicable. And the, uh, it's not always that will happen because sometimes we get to know people in a way that we can reinforce that label about them. Then that doesn't help. That means if I'm wanting to know, if I'm envious of someone and I'm wanting to know all the details about that person by which my envy will increase for them, then that means all I want to know is how undeserving this person is for all the praise that they are getting. Then that will not decrease my envy. But if we try to understand them as a person, as a conscious being, then to a large extent, uh, uh, large extent, what happens is that... Uh, the relationship becomes more multidimensional. And that's how it is in normal relationships also. Say if there is a male-female attraction as a basis of a long-term relationship and they're going to have a dharmic union, they're going to get married, then initially the attraction may be based on desire. Uh, it could be physical desire also. But as the, two, as the couple gets to know each other more and more, then yes, that desire may be a part of the relationship, maybe an important part also. But that doesn't define the relationship. We start understanding each other more and more. And then, the, then we, so basically getting to know each other, seeing the humanity and the spirituality of others helps us make the relationship more multidimensional. And uh, Angel has made one comment that the gopis were attracted by their lusty desires. So I would like to clarify that quickly. <laughs> there are two things over there. One is that there are, the word lust, when the word calm is used, the Sanskrit word calm has many different meanings in Sanskrit itself. It, it's sometimes translated as lust. Generally, generally, we think of, especially on the spiritual path, we think of lust as undesirable. And then we may say, how could the gopis who are pure devotees have lust? So what is explained is that among the gopis, the gopis are Krishna, the, the, they are the cowherd maidens, the cowherd girls in Krishna's pastoral parasite of paradise of Vrindavan. Now, not all of them were pure devotees. Some of them were seekers who, by some level of spirituality, they had been born in the vicinity of Vrindavan. So when they saw Krishna, their attraction might have been material for them. So Radharani's attraction for Krishna is not karma. The intimate gopis who are uh, the, the uh, who are parts of Krishna's associates in the spiritual world, that is not the uh, the sexual desire of lust. That is a pure transcendental desire. But there were some who were attracted to Krishna because he was just his form was so attractive. But even they became purified. So this does not refer to all the gopis. This refers to specifically those categories of gopis who were not yet puri pur purified, but they happened to be in Krishna Lila and their attraction purified them. Okay. There's one last question. Yes, Julie? 
Uh, good morning, Hare Krishna. Thank you so much. Um, can you please clarify? I really enjoy this talk because I feel like I can identify in my own life different, like when I'm on different points of that spectrum between motivation and contemplation. Can you please clarify? Is our practice to come to the center with the two? Is that our sadhana and our association with other devotees? Is it just acknowledging, being able to acknowledge when we're on one end or the other and like trying to scale it to center? Um, can you just make that clarification? Oh, okay. It's a good question. Thank you. So how do we have a healthy blend of both motivation and uh, contemplation? So the intellectual and the emotional aspects, we can say. In the Bhagavad Gita, several times, Krishna says, Mai arpit mano buddhir maam evaishyasya samshayaha. In 8.7, I think again 12, in the 12th chapter, I think 12.18, he says that, Mai arpit, offer to me. Arpit is to offer mana buddhi. Mana is our emotional side, broadly speaking. Buddhi is our rational intellectual side. And in this way, when you offer your mind and intelligence to me, you will come to me. Maam evaishyasya asamshayaha. Certainly you will come to me. So now for all of us, so what that means, what Krishna is again saying is that our inner world, see we have our physical, physical life and the physical world. Krishna is saying more important than that is to offer our inner world, our thoughts, our mind and our intelligence to him. Now each of us has a particular nature. Maybe some of us may be more rational, some of us may be more emotional. So is it that an emotional person has to become more rational? Or a rational person has to become more emotional? Well, that's not the key thing. The key thing is, somebody may have a, their inner world where say they are defined 70% by their rationality and 30% by their emotionality. Somebody else may be, they will define 70% by their emotionality and 30% by their rationality. Now when I say defined by means, primarily that's how they react. That they respond to situations. It's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. That's the way they are. But the point is, the way we are, we offer our inner world to Krishna. And overall, is it that we ought to have an ideal 50-50% balance? No, it's not like that. As we are, in one sense, we offer ourselves to Krishna. So we try to connect emotionally also, we try to connect rationally also. So for some of us, if we are more emotional, then maybe there are certain aspects of bhakti which may be more attracted to. So when we go, when we associate with devotees, Maybe the way devotees greet, greet each other, the, 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 the cordiality, the warmth, the sense of belonging, that's what draws us. And that's what we look forward to. That's wonderful. Simultaneously, even if we don't feel that attracted to classes, we hear the classes. We hear them and try to understand. That may not be our primary more inspiration, but still we hear. And conversely, if philosophy is what attracts us, and then they are socializing, this is just the boredom. No, but try to be happy, cordial, try to be friendly with devotees. So try to engage in all aspects of bhakti, even if we are attracted particularly to more some aspects of bhakti. So that way we'll be able to offer our mind and intelligence both. Does that answer your question? No? Thank you very much. Kantraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Shri Prabhupada ki jai. Chitanya Chiran Prabhu Ki Jai.